Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit. It's our One Detroit Education Town Hall. Where are schools headed almost a year into COVID? Students share their struggles with online and hybrid school. Superintendents across Southeast Michigan explain their decision making. And teachers reveal how they're working to meet the needs of kids across the board. It's all ahead this week on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Triple A, Nissan Foundation, Ally. Impact at Home. UAW, Solidarity Forever. And viewers like you, thank you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for being with me. Each week you can watch One Detroit right here on Detroit Public Television, but we also expand our conversations with town halls and community meetings off the air. It's part of our effort to connect you with the issues that matter most to your families and your neighborhoods and really bring a broader understanding to our viewers at home as well. So about two weeks ago, we had a One Detroit Education Town Hall, and this show is dedicated to that conversation. It was an hour-long Zoom town hall where we heard from teachers, superintendents, and students. We had a a lot of parents in the audience as well asking questions from state testing to funding to better online learning. Education during COVID has been difficult for everyone involved. And we'll start with the kids who are adjusting every day to learning in a time of COVID. Here are our local students that are a part of the PBS NewsHour's student reporting labs sharing with us the challenges of online school. One thing we're going into like the building like before COVID you were able to like put like home things behind you and just focus like on your work because you're you know in the building or in the environment of students and teachers. I feel like for me I didn't really have a designated area to do my work or to do my classes so it was just weird. Not weird but it was it didn't feel like school and a lot of like distractions at home. If I had a choice I don't think um I would choose to do virtual learning. Virtual learning is great and all, and the teachers are doing a great job of adjusting and helping their students learn, but nothing beats in-person learning. We've been doing face-to-face -face for about a week now with majority of our first semester being virtual. When we had virtual learning, that was, that was the worst, frankly, at least for me. I felt like giving up in classes and some of them I did. I don't really do well online. My grades, slip when I do online because I feel like school's an option when I'm at home and so I procrastinate and then I don't do my work and then my grades drop but when I'm actually in school I do all my work and I get good grades. Going from online to back in person was really hard for me because I was behind online it's a, a lot harder to stay focused online but being in person actually is way better than online. Some of my friends, they like so far behind because COVID threw them off. Nobody knew this was gonna happen. So they like confused on online work, but you know, they try. For me, I ask a lot of questions and um, I rely on teachers to be there for me. And it was hard for me because I would have to text them, you know, wait for their response and I'm over here, you know, stressing about it. I'm currently all in-person school. We did switch to online at one point, but now we are back in person. My social life has actually changed a lot. I don't really talk to my friends as much because we don't see each other. Uh, there's not a lot of social time for us to talk at school anymore. Uh, we do have lunch together, but it's very distant and not the same as it used to be. I'm doing hybrid, so that means that I go to school, 
just a few times and then I do online for the rest of my classes. There are no after school activities right now unless you are literally by yourself just practicing alone because we're not allowed to. Sports got canceled, pushed back, you're wearing masks all the time, you can't take them off. I've been trying to be more careful, you know, wearing a mask literally everywhere, but sometimes you just still get it. I'm most worried about getting my family sick and then that kind of spreading to more people. So we have to take a lot of extra precautions. We have to wear masks constantly. And there's always that threat of being switched again to online uh, like we just were. So online school was definitely different because it, it was still school. So it was different than last year's online school because it was still school. So we still had to wake up in time and we still had assignments that were due, whereas last year it was credit, no credit. So last year we didn't necessarily have to wake up for every single Zoom, but this year it was important that we did because it all counted. I'm kind of just looking forward to the end of the year because I know that I won't have to wear a mask as much because I won't be in school all day. Going back to lockdown would probably be the worst thing to happen to me. That's not something that I'm looking forward to, but what I am looking forward to is getting out of this. You know, it's looking pretty good right now. We're here right now, so I would consider that a win. As each student learns in their own way, the teachers have to meet them where they are. Here's my conversation with Jeannie Wilson, a middle school teacher at Ann Arbor STEAM at Northside, Dorothea Williams, an ELA teacher at Cass Tech in Detroit, and Beth Friedman, a Spanish teacher at Summit Academy North High School. Okay, Jeannie, so tell me, what is a typical day like for you? And if you want me to pretend to be a student, I'll turn my camera so you can only see the top <laughs> of my head. I mean, is this essentially what you guys look at every day? I know it is. I see my I kids see, stuff. I see and hear all kinds of things. <laughs> so, I bet you do. So tell um, us, what's a typical, uh, t are you lecturing the whole time? Are there breakout rooms, uh, projects? Um, How have you been able to do this for a, almost a year now? Yeah. Um, so... I start my morning with my advisory group, which is my home base. And I really try to work on building relationships with that group. So, um, you know, it's a lot of dialogue with the kiddos and, you know, it's like uh, by all means necessary, they can contribute. They can put things in the chat. They can unmute and talk. They can, there's even like the annotate feature where they can write on my slides. It's been really interesting to see the different ways kids want to communicate their thinking. And um, so that's how I start. And then we have a block schedule. So I will see one class for 90 minutes. Then we have a half hour break. Usually I can touch base with some kids in that time. I'm sending a lot of emails, texting parents, where's your kid? And then we have another block. Yeah, yeah. go <laughs> and ahead. Then we, and then we have lunch and then a third block. So it's, it's a pretty long day. Those blocks are 90 minute long, minutes long. And there's how does that grab you? Do you like the 90 minutes or is that, I mean, that's very different than a 50 mm -hmm. minute class and then changing and, you know, being able to get a new class in. I have taught in a block schedule school before. So I actually um, have not had too much trouble with that. I really feel like I end up with time to connect with kids. So the flow of class, you know, we have a discussion that's like, or on the computer, like a typed discussion. And then we have activities and we then we have some sort of writing project that we're doing or something. And I'm able to go into breakout rooms and connect with kids and have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations or small group conversations with them. So if they were shorter, I think it would be really hard to reach kids. So mm -hmm. it's been pretty good. Dorothy, what about you? What's it, what's it like doing ELA for sophomores and juniors? What's, what's a typical day like for you? Um, a typical day um, in my classroom, my virtual classroom, is um, we see uh, half of our students on one day and then the other half on another day. And I should tell you, our students petitioned to have us change the schedule. And our superintendent agreed to it. See, our kids are pretty vocal. So they decided and they looked at other school models and decided that they were very stressed out having to be online all day. So I'll see three of my classes on one day, maybe two on another day. We meet with all of our kids um, on Wednesday and the afternoon is just for asynchronous time. Any time that we need to tutor students or connect with students. But a typical day is I make a production out of attendance. We spend, I spend 10 minutes you know, listening to voices or encouraging them to uh, turn on their cameras. 
Um, and it, it works out. I'm, I'm finding that I get a much better response when I take a little bit of extra time, um, like you, Janine, to really connect with the kids. It's harder online, of course. It's harder to assess uh, whether or not they're struggling because some of them are under the covers, right? So, yeah. so um, it seems to, believe it or not, um, my students are fairly receptive to that. And they're even more receptive because our superintendent agreed to allow them to change their schedule. Beth, give us the day in the life of you in terms of your classrooms and your kids and teaching Spanish. We start out every morning, we have an AB schedule. So my uh, periods, period one, I see half my students on A days and half on B. So that's similar to Dorothea's yeah. schedule in that regard. But on the days that I don't see my students, I still have a first uh, morning check-in. So I do get to connect with all my students every day. It's just a matter of uh, who I see on which day. And I've required them to keep their computers on. With, with language, it's important for me to be able to see their faces and to see them speak. So when, especially when we get into the breakout rooms and I, I'm, I'm like Jeannie said, using the breakout rooms, it makes it so much more personal, I think to be able to touch base with those students. You know, uh, we're also talking about learning loss. We talked about it with the superintendents and, and, and Dr. Vidi and Dorothea, let me ask you, because it almost feels like it comes in and rests on your shoulders. Um, so you have to continue to do the output that you were usually doing a year before. You lost the spring and now you're finding your way through, through this. Um, as from a teacher's perspective, what do you think about that? And what are you working on? Well, you know, I struggle with this one because of course we want our children to do well, right? We wanna narrow that achievement gap. But I think it's really important, um, at least, and I can only speak for my district, you know, we have a lot of struggling children, we have a lot of poverty. Um, yeah. I really believe that when the kids are better taken care of, when their psychosocial needs are cared for, they will bounce back, they will, right, continue to improve. So for me, I'm a little bit more flexible, right? Um, I have conversations with my students about how important it is for them to demonstrate progress. However, that's um, not as it's important, but I think their emotional needs, um, uh, the, caring for their emotional needs are also important and helping them understand that when you're struggling, um, we're here, I'm here. Beth, you wanted to say? Yeah, you had mentioned, Dorothea, about the psychosocial uh, aspect of it. Sure. Uh, I spent oh, a good 45 minutes today with a student just because she was so overwhelmed yeah. by the whole situation. And it's, it, 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 I believe that that's the most important thing for us as, as educators is to understand that these are kids, these are human beings, and their whole apple cart was disrupted. And Absolutely. we need to be there for them first and foremost. And if we show that outpouring, they will work. Uh, I think the most important thing is that we don't let this pressure for these expectations that some of which are a little bit made up rest on the shoulders of the children. They should not be under so much pressure. So we need to nurture them. We need to coach them. We need them on track and moving forward in their learning, but we do not need to put the stress of learning loss on the kids. That's right. The big overarching decisions that are happening at districts are made by the superintendents and administration. Each district has to cater to what their specific school community needs. I checked in with Dr. Rich Macheski, superintendent of Troy Schools, Mark Greathead, superintendent at Woodhaven Brownstown School District, Mike Duvall, superintendent at Macomb Intermediate School District, and Dr. Alicia Fly, chief academic officer for Macomb ISD. I'd like you, each one of you to describe your district briefly. And as of this week, whether you're in seat, online, if there's a hybrid, what your school community has chosen and how many are opting to come back. So if I could start with you, Rich and Troy. Sure, absolutely. So in Troy, we are, we're in our hybrid uh, model right now, which for us is five days at the elementary and four days for all students wishing to, to take part in in-seat in, uh, instruction at the secondary level, so 612. 
Approximately 60% of, of families in Troy have chosen to remain virtual, which means uh, there are 40% uh, total about, of about 40% of families choosing to be in seat. About 50% of those uh, at the elementary level, about 40% of <clears throat> school and about 30% uh, at the high school level. So we are fortunate to have um, those that wish to be in seat, in seat for a good portion of the week in Troy. Okay, Mark, give us an idea of what's happening in Woodhaven Brownstown School District, um, what your situation is right now and what the community has decided in terms of opting in. Certainly, uh, beginning in September, we offered our, our parents and our students a choice. 60% uh, chose to come to school on a daily basis, grades K through 12. 40% chose to be fully remote. Uh, and we've been able to do that uh, successfully since, with the exception of the uh, November pause. Uh, when uh, high school students were paused, uh, we also paused uh, in-person education uh, for grades K through eight as well. Uh, right, uh, right before winter break and the, the, weeks, the two weeks after winter break, uh, we brought uh, all of our students back in a uh, every other day schedule. Uh, what we call our safe start to uh, bring kids back gradually. Uh, but right now, uh, for the last uh, three weeks, we've had right back at that 60% in person every day and 40% remote. Uh, we've offered our parents uh, the opportunity to uh, change their mind at uh, card marking breaks. And each time we come to a, a transition, uh, we get about 50-50. You know, we get about an equal number that want to come in person as we do that want to transition to remote. And one of the things that we think is unique about the program that we've offered is all of our students are being taught directly by Woodhaven Brownstown School District teachers. Uh, so even our remote students, we have a, a very limited class size. Uh, we stick to it uh, and we do that so that their transition back into the classroom can be as seamless as possible. You know, it's interesting to see the numbers, you know, flipped in, in, in the two districts that we're talking about, which really just goes to the point that each district is making individual choices that services the people in their district and that's right for them. And that's what's so difficult, I think, when you talk across the board change or across the board, um, you know, um, policies that you need to have in place that it is so individualized to different districts and different demographic areas. Mike, let's talk about Macomb. Um, give us an overview county-wise about where you are in terms of in-seat online or combination? Yeah, just for your listeners' information, we have 22 districts, including the ISD here within the county, about 130,000 students, uh, give or take. So we have, uh, if I, I can just start with the ISD with our special needs students, we've been uh, in person since September 8th, but with an option of parents uh, uh, to choose remote. And then the other uh, 21 districts, uh, we're, we're pretty much uh, have all options on the table. We've got some districts that have 15% uh, remote and others at 50. But of the 22 districts, and, and just last past couple of weeks, Chippewa and Utica have, have uh, started their programs. So the majority of our districts are in-person education options. And I think that uh, we've learned a lot from it and our parents appreciate it. And so Alicia, when we look at all of this and we hear from different districts across the area, you know, we're getting some questions from people who are in our town hall right now. Uh, our superintendents, our districts and ISDs is sharing within the, within the counties about what they're doing across the area saying, this is working for us, this isn't working for us and, and looking at a shared set of data. Um, absolutely, Christy. Um, one of the things that, that we've done since the school closure last spring, we meet, um, last spring we were almost meeting daily with our uh, 21 superintendents throughout Macomb County to do exactly what you're describing. And we've continued to meet. Now it's about uh, weekly. It's at least once a week. But if something surfaces, we meet even more frequently if we feel we come together, that we need to come together and we're having those exact conversations. We, the, the superintendents report the status of where they are in terms of their instructional delivery and talk about what's going well or things to consider as you transition because as Superintendent DeVault mentioned, um, with a, a county the size of Macomb County, um, we have a variety of options that are occurring 
but each of our districts um, are, um, almost all of our districts do have at least an in-person option. And what has been critical that we've heard from both um, uh, uh, Dr. Macheski and, um, and Mr. Gearhart as well is that the, that survey piece in terms of getting input from families and needing to be nimble and flexible because as we've navigated, you know, just this unknown territory with all of us regarding the pandemic, um, our, our goal is to, to best meet our students and families' needs and having their voice about, you know, where they are and their situations has been critical. Would you welcome, let me start with you, Rich, would you welcome, and we're getting this question coming in right now, um, centralized decision-making coming down from the state, or do you believe that the autonomy that the districts have is in the best interest of what you're doing right now? What we've talked about in Oakland County, and we talked about this from the very beginning of the pandemic, is what we really wanted to see from the state were, uh, were more clear, was more clear guidance around what is considered safe and what is not. What are those thresholds that we should be looking at as a community? Because we're not health officers. So if you could provide us thresholds that we should be considering as to when it's safe and when it may not be safe, that's all we would really want at the state level and then allow us at the local level to make those decisions based upon the needs within our community. Uh, Mark, you know, I, I, I came up with a, a list of questions and I could talk to you guys forever, but I keep seeing the word challenge on my list of questions like what are the challenges? What are the challenges? Let me ask you, what has gone right during this entire process? And then what has been your biggest challenge? Uh, choice has, has been what's gone right. Uh, that, that's enabled us to try to provide uh, support uh, that can best meet uh, the needs of the students. Uh, the students that we listened to earlier, hearing, hearing their anxiety uh, just really hit me. And, and it only starts to scratch the surface. So if uh, I, I transition into challenges, challenges ahead of, for us, or challenges that we've experienced and then the challenges ahead for us are uh, having the resources and support that we need to address not just learning loss, but also the social emotional impact that, that the pandemic has had on our students. And that needs to start sooner rather than later. Well, let's get to the learning loss. There is a recent poll um, from Education Trust Midwest that came out. 85% of parents say state leaders should have a plan to address pandemic learning loss and make sure kids are back on grade level. Alicia, let me go to you. How extensive do you believe the learning loss is? How can you measure it? And what plans are you working on in Macomb with Mike to uh, to address this? Our our local districts um, have the you know they have the opportunity they've administered local assessments, and so they've had the opportunity to look at and see where some of the learning loss is occurring, where some of the gaps are. Um, a little surprisingly, and I, but this is reflective in some recent nation, national data that we saw as well. Um, we see a, a larger gap in mathematics than in reading as we were digging into some of our, our data. But um, districts are already talking and beginning to put plans in place to address that. Um, in our county, we already offered um, a pretty robust um, you know, summer learning opportunities for students. And we are, we've begun planning even earlier for that. Um, and so that students can have the opportunity to just to catch up on, on some of the learning that has been disrupted this year. Rich, let me ask you, let's talk a little bit about safety and funding. Do you believe that you have the funding necessary to make sure that your schools are safe when kids roll back in, whenever the vaccine rollout gets up and going and we have more of the community vaccinated? I think um, I, I will give um, the state uh, credit from the perspective of they have um, they have attempted to make funds available as quickly as as possible. I think we we continue to need we will continue to need more funds for things such as hiring counselors for social workers individuals to address to your point the social emotional well being of of the, the students within our community because that's going to last well down. I mean PPE will go away that those components are gonna last well into uh, the years, uh, several years down the road. So I, I don't think there's enough funding with respect to making sure that we can retain individuals like that. Um, the, other, the other key is giving us flexibility, use the, the, the spending or the monies where we see fit. 
Every community is different. What Macomb may need, uh, it, may, it may be different than what we need in some areas in Oakland. So having the resources, but having the flexibility to utilize, spend those resources where we most need them is also extremely important. I also spoke at length separately with Dr. Vitti at Detroit Public Schools Community District. You can see that conversation at OneDetroitPBS.org. And that is going to do it for our One Detroit Education Town Hall. Make sure you stay with us for more stories we're following on schools during COVID. I'll see you next week. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Triple A, Nissan Foundation, Ally. Impact at Home. UAW, solidarity forever. And viewers like you, thank you.